Welcome to video number nine, Solomon Sadume here. In this video, we will uh, try to uh, go through the solution uh, problem set from uh, video number seven and video number eight. Uh, so this is supposed to take uh, quite a very, very short time because I, I do not intend to use uh, many simulations, in fact, any simulations at all. So without any further ado, let's get moving. Okay, so in... Uh, Problem set number seven, there were four questions that I asked you to try on your own. And let's see, uh, check out uh, whether you got this correctly or not. Uh, either way, uh, by the end of the video, you should know where you made a mistake and uh, make the necessary cor uh, correction. Uh, in uh, uh, video number seven, we looked at how to determine the uh, implied domain for rational functions. And uh, what you see here, so we looked at rational functions, we looked at uh, square root functions, and in uh, problem set seven, we are looking at how to determine the implied domain for these square root uh, functions, okay? So this was the first uh, question I asked you to do. Uh, f of x is given by the square root of 3x minus 1, and your task is to find the implied domain of this uh, function, uh, try to find... Uh, the range as well. Now we have a general idea of how uh, the square root functions look. So once you know where the, uh, the graph starts or the lowest or the boundary position of the x, you can always determine the rest of the function. And then from there, we can then find the range of the function. So we'll try to sketch as well, all right? So question this in this question here, please remember that how we reasoned that for square root functions, the argument or we also refer to this as what so either the argument of any function and in this case because it's a square root function we refer to this as um, the radicand of the function all right so we reason for a square root function that the radicand radicand has always to be the radicand must be greater than must be greater than or equal to zero. So, starting that again, so here we'll say that 3x there minus, minus 1, I think it is, must be greater than or equal to zero. So the radicand must be greater than, always greater than or equal to zero. So if we do that, so this is minus 1 must be greater than or equal to 0. Uh, make x the subject of the formula by moving the negative 1 to the other side. We have 3x is greater than or equal to positive 1. If we divide by 3, we get that x is greater than or equal to 1 over 3. And ideally, this is our domain. But then we usually want to write it in a, um, a set builder notation, in which case we will say that 1 over 3, okay, so x is in the real set so that 1 over 3 is less than x, is less than infinity, and then we close the brackets, uh, we, uh, we close with uh, uh, braces like that. And so this is the domain of this square root function. We can sketch this function now. All right, so we draw the x axis. We know that x must be greater than or equal to a third. So if this is the y axis, so zero is there, then maybe a third is somewhere here. And we know the graph must be greater than or equal to that. So we can start from that point and draw a curve that way. This is the graph of the general shape because we are asked to be, uh, uh, simply uh, sketch. We don't need to do anything very serious with this. So that is sufficient as a, a sketch of uh, our square root function, f of x equals root of 3x minus 1. This is sufficient. And by looking at this now, we can see how what the range is. We can write that the range of the function is uh, y is in the real set so that y is greater than 0, so 0 is uh, less than or equal to y, which is less than positive infinity, and we put the braces. That is how we solve this particular problem. All right, should be straightforward. If you have uh, watched the previous video, video number seven, this should be uh, very, very, you know, smooth sail. 
Okay, let's try the next question. So in the case of the square root functions, we just have to reason that uh, the argument has to be greater than or equal to zero. And why do we do that? Because we reason that inside the square root sign, we cannot have a negative number. We cannot determine the square root of a negative number. So for that reason, all values must be greater than uh, zero. Next. Okay, so this was uh, part B of the question uh, from set seven. All right, so similarly, same, same story. We reason that the, uh, the radicand there or the argument, the argument being one minus two X, this value here must be greater than or equal to zero for us to be able to find its square root. So uh, uh, we want to make X the subject of the formula. We'll write minus two X. Now we need to be very careful minus 2x equals negative 1. Now then we divide by negative 2. Remember when you divide by a negative number, the sign of the inequality flips. All right, so if we divide by negative 2 here, we get x. Let me just write the whole thing for the sake of uh, uh, those who might not have experienced this before. So we can write this as minus 2x divided by negative 2 must be greater than r Actually, this now would not be this, but we'll write it there like that. We are dividing by a negative number. For that reason, the sign of the inequality has to flip. So we can't write this anymore. So this goes back there like that. The sign has flipped. And now we put negative 1 over negative 2. Whenever we divide or multiply by a negative number, the sign of the inequality flips like that. And now we have x is less than or equal to, and this is now positive a half. Okay, once again, we draw our graph x-axis. We place our y-axis there. Okay, now we have uh, the position of x is a half, but we are told x has to be less, so it has to be on that side, and so our graph goes like that. All right. Uh, we may want to find the y-intercept. Sometimes the examiner might ask us to find the y-intercept. All we need to do is reason that at the y-intercept, the value of x is always 0. So we go back to the function. If you remember, our function is f of x. f of x is uh, 1 minus 2x root, like that. So if we are going to put uh, uh, at the y-intercept x is 0, we bring x is 0 there. And we get f of 0, x is 0, is the square root of 1, which is 1. And therefore, the y-intercept here is 1. And by looking at the graph, we are in a position now to write down the range of the function. The values of y must be from 0 going onwards, just like before. So generally, the range of a square root function will usually be this, unless there is something added here or subtracted. So in this case, we'll just say the range just like before, the range is y that is real, all real numbers, okay, such that they lie between 0, all values of y lie between 0 and positive infinity, and this is how we write the range in the set builder notation. Really, really easy stuff. Once you get the hang of it, you can uh, eventually, you should be able to just look at a function and tell what the domain is and even what the range is. Except that when you're doing this for an examiner, they want to see the process like this, and so you try to show it. Always also try to sketch it. This way, you're able to... Uh, you don't get lost when you're trying to... You don't make mistakes as you try to find uh, the range of the function. Okay? That's the second question. We go to the third one. Right, so here is the, the third question from lesson number seven. We are given that uh, f of x is the square root of x plus one all together and then plus three. So you notice this is a bit different from uh, the last two questions we've looked at in the sense that there is an addition of three there. If you've done some transformation of functions, then you know that the plus three there has the effect on the main function of raising it or lowering it uh, uh, along the y-axis. So in this case, it causes the function to rise 
three uh, vertical steps, all right, or three units uh, uh, in the positive y direction, okay? So that's what uh, the positive three there does, nothing else really. Uh, as for the domain, we use the same, same rule that we did use, and we say that uh, the argument here, x plus one, must be greater than or equal to zero, so x must be greater than or equal to negative one. Again, that is our uh, uh, domain, and we can write this in set builder notation by just saying uh, the, the, uh, the domain uh, x is a member of the real set, so that x is always greater than negative one, greater than or equal to negative one, and less than positive infinity, and close the braces like that, and that's really the domain, okay? We can use the same method to find the range. So draw a graph there. This is our y-axis and x-axis, okay? This is zero, and we look for negative one, x is greater than. So if this is negative one, ideally we should now draw, we should now draw the graph here like this. Okay, starting from zero, and rising that way. I'm using pink there to try and uh, make this more understandable. However, all right, so if this three was not there, then this is how our graph would look. In fact, it would pass through, if we only had this part here, it would pass through when x is zero, it would pass through positive one. When x is zero, we have square root of one there. So this would be positive one, and that's this point here. So this point, the original point, would be positive one if we didn't have that three there. But now we have the three, so when x is zero, if we put zero there, the square root side will give us positive one, but then we have to add three, so the new y-intercept is going to be at four. So now my graph has to be slightly higher. Okay, so that would now be my y axis, and this point would have added three steps, and now this is going to be my y intercept. It's going to be at four. Okay, so the y intercept is now at four. Uh, when x is negative one, when x is negative one, put negative one there, we have zero. Negative one plus one is zero. Square root of zero is zero. Zero plus three is three, so this point would be at three, like that, and the graph would repeat itself, it would be this, but it's been all shifted up like that. So the graph now starts at three and not at zero. So that is the, what uh, the effect of adding a three to the function is. And so if we are now asked to write down what the range is, you should be able to clearly see that the range, I'll write this in pink or even orange, so that we market, demarcate the, we can easily, we can see the difference. And thus, so we have the range being equal, uh, y being members of the real set, such that y lies, uh, starts from three, so it's from three onwards. So, uh, uh, y is greater than or equal to 3 and less than infinity. And so this was the difference between this function and the other functions that we've looked at. I hope you, you have been able to, you were able to understand, especially how the 3 here affects the function, okay? All right, let's, let's move on to the next. Uh, in... Uh, in this set, in this problem set, I think there were four questions, so one more to go, and then we can move to the problems in uh, set uh, from lesson eight, that is. Right, so here is uh, part D of uh, problem set seven. Um, once again, uh, we use the idea for the axiom for square root function. Uh, the argument, like before, has to be a number that is uh, greater than zero. We'll do this a bit differently because of the nature of that argument. As you can see, it's a, a, a quadratic function. 
uh, the coefficient of uh, x squared is negative, so we know how that function looks like. It's a concave down uh, parabola. So the argument has to be greater than or equal to zero. We factorize the left-hand side there, and um, x into 1 uh, minus x must be greater than or equal to zero, meaning this product has to be positive. So if the product is positive, then either x is greater than or equal to zero, okay, x is greater than or equal to zero, or the bracket there is greater than or equal to zero, all right, in which case, in which case uh, we can show that x is less than or equal to 1. Well, we can show that very quickly here. Uh, if, one, if 1 minus x is greater than or equal to 0, then minus x minus x is greater than or equal to, we move 1 to the other side, becomes negative 1. Divide both sides by negative 1, and we know when we divide by a negative number, the sign of the inequality flips, and so we end up with x is less than or equal to positive 1, and that's how we get that, right? So we have two scenarios, x is uh, greater than or equal to 0, and x is less than or equal to 1, all right? Now, uh, we would also, we can also reason that the, pro uh, the product cannot, the two numbers can also be negative, both can be negative because the product of two negative numbers is also 1, but we don't need to go into that now because uh, this is a quadratic, <coughs> the, uh, the argument is a quadratic, uh, which is a concave down, and because of that we know that, that the function uh, cannot be on the negative side. So uh, uh, let, let's show that uh, shortly. So let's keep these two results up here for the time being, and remove this. And so we sketch the graph, if we sketch this graph, uh, start with the, uh, the x-axis there, uh, then a y-axis, we know that the graph lies between or is uh, dictated by these two points, so we indicate those two points on the graph, 0 and 1, and we know the graph is greater than or equal to 0, so must be on this side of 0, and it's less than 1, so it's on that side, so the graph is in between. Uh, <clears throat> when we sketch that function, I want to sketch both uh, the argument so the dotted line shows the graph of the argument, that is the quadratic function in there. It is a, a concave down parabola, <clears throat> okay? And uh, if we are going to look for the square root, definitely we'll not look for the square root of that because it's already negative. So there's no point of looking at for, for the square root of that. So we are interested in values that are in here, okay? Now if we look for the square root of these values lying between 0 and 1, we get this curve here with a peak at 0 0.5, 0 0.5. As you can see, this is the function, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the radicand, if you like, or the argument of the square root function. And what you have the up there, uh, the green line refers to the square root function. And so this is how, how our function f of x looks like. Uh, what is the range of this function? And that should now be easy. It's basically be from 0, values of y starting from 0, and having a maximum of 0 0.5. Right, so uh, the next question there is, I think, now from lesson number 8, problem A. And now we have reciprocal functions. What we've just dealt with were square root functions. So let's look at uh, these reciprocal functions. Uh, the first one there is 1 over x minus 3. Now when it comes to reciprocal function, thinking about the axioms we discussed, right, we reason that the denominator can never be equal to 0. That's the reasoning for reciprocal functions. And so straight away when we look at this, we say the denominator there is x minus 3 cannot be equal to 0. Okay, for that function, uh, uh, for us to be able to determine that function or for that function to be defined, the denominator must not be a zero. If we rearrange this, we can see that x cannot be equal to three. So x can take any value other than three. If we sketch this function, these are uh, uh, reciprocal functions are always a curve here and a curve there. We have four quadrants, okay? If one curve is here, the other one is there, all right? If one curve is here, the other one is here, all right? So if that is our function there, that, that, that line doesn't look very nice. So I'll do it again. 
Okay, so one line horizontal, one line vertical, that's much better. This is my y-axis, this is my x-axis. x must not be 3, which means that we go to the point 3, the point with the coordinates 3, and draw a vertical asymptote there to say that x must not take a value of 3. So x can be anything but not 3, okay? And so uh, how does the graph look on this side of the function? We can also reason like this. Uh, so we have there uh, 1 over x minus 3. Let's work with this. So if we take a number like 4 and put 4 here, then I have 1. Okay, so what is f? This is f of x. What is f of 4? A number to this side of 3. Well, that gives me 1 over 4 minus 3, which is 1 over 1, which is positive 1. So we know the function is on the positive side. This is sometimes referred to as a sign diagram. So on this side, the graph is going to be up. What about on this side? We can take, um, uh, we can't take, we can't take uh, what? We could take 1 if we wanted. We can take a value of x equal to 1 or even a value of x equal to 0. If we put a 0 here, we get a negative a third, which is to say on this side, the graph is below the, below the uh, x-axis. So because of that, I know that on this side, my curve must go that way. You, you get better at it with, uh, with practice. Okay? And on this side, the curve must come like that and go down. And now we can look for the y-intercept there. What's the value of the y-intercept? The value of y when x is 0 put x is 0 there, we get negative 1 over 3, that is our y-intercept. And this is the graph of this function. So then the question is, what's the domain, or what's the range of the function? Well, the range of this function can be seen, the graph does not cross the x-axis, so we can have uh, values of y that are greater than 0, because this continues on to infinity, okay? And here continues on to negative infinity, does not cross the x-axis. So we can say that y is anything in the real set, okay, but y cannot be equal to zero. Anything in the, in the uh, real set, in the y-axis, except y must not be equal to zero. This is enough as uh, uh, the range of this particular function. I hope this is clear as well. All right, this, this is not as uh, confusing as the previous case we just looked at. Right, the second question there, the second question, that is C, and that is uh, uh, B. All right, same, same story. We reason that x plus 3 must not be equal to 0, which is to say x must not be equal to negative 3. And already we know where that is, so I'm going to sketch it directly uh, before I even write down the domain and the range. I know that uh, at negative x is negative 3, we have an asymptote. So I can go right away and go to negative 3 and draw a vertical asymptote. So this is at negative 3, like that. Okay, I can try to find out on which side the function is. So when x is uh, negative 2, for example, I can put negative 2 here and I get 1 over 1, because negative 2 plus 3 is 1. So 1 over 1 is positive. So on this side, the function is positive up here above the x-axis, but on this side, the function is positive here when I put negative 2. I can put, you know, 0. If I put 0 here, I get positive a third. So the graph crosses at positive a third, somewhere there. This is the y-axis, remember? Okay, and so on. So on this side, the graph is positive, and if the graph is on this quadrant, so this splits it into... Think of the asymptote and the x-axis splits it into four parts, okay? So this side already contains the function. The function is here. Therefore, the function has to be on the other side. And now I draw that curve here. Should approach zero, but not touch the x-axis. 
and on this side I should also have one like that and this is my function okay now I can talk about my domain and range my domain is already here so I just need to say uh, the domain is x uh, is as a member of the real set but x must not be negative 3 that is sufficient and the same thing for the range I'll say y is in the real set except y must not be uh, equal to zero okay so anything up anything down but not crossing uh, the x-axis all right so that's that that is b of uh, lesson eight exercises i hope you got that right Right, number C. All right, we have another quadratic here. So the denominator is not zero, so we can say, now this, if you look at it, that's a, a, a difference of two squares, right? So we are saying x, x squared minus four must not be zero. If we can factorize this in one step because it's a difference of two squares, we would write that as, well, let me just explain. If a squared, if we have a squared minus b squared, we can write this as a plus b into a minus b. We refer to this as the conjugates, okay, binomial. So a fraction containing two terms is called a binomial expression. So if we have two binomial expressions being multiplied, we call this a binomial product. But if you look at the uh, uh, the first one is a plus, the second one is minus, it's like uh, an identical twins. So this, uh, these two twins, they are not identical. All right. So when we have this, they are referred to as conjugates. Conjugates. For those who may have forgotten this, these are called conjugates. But if they were identical, so conjugate binomial pairs give us a difference of two squares. So if you open this bracket, you'll get a squared minus b squared. If they were identical, like a plus b into a plus b, or a plus b, or a minus b into a minus b, then this is called a perfect square. And this would give us a squared plus twice a b plus b squared, like that. All right? Uh, this is not the discussion. I'm just interested in that. Now, when we look at this, you can see that it is indeed a difference of two squares. This is the same as two squared. So this is x squared minus 2 squared must not be 0. I can open this the same way up where we see here. And I'll write x minus 2 in one bracket and x plus 2 in the other bracket must not be equal to 0. I hope you understood. Now I can remove this. Okay, so the, the product must not be a 0. So if we are to find the values of x that will uh, uh, disobey this, if I make x a 2 here, this bit becomes a 0 and will render the whole thing 0, which will mess up. So x is 2 is what we are looking for. We are looking for something that is going to mess up, right? So x is 2 is one of our solution, all right? And x is, so x is 2, because if I put 2 here, then I have 2 minus 2, which will give us 0. Now here I have x plus 2, so the value of x of negative 2 will do the exact same thing. So this must be my uh, vertical asymptote. So if I draw this graph, they also tell me the stuff that I should not include uh, in the domain. All right, so one is at negative 2, the other one is at positive 2. So I can draw here, this is minus 2, and on this side, I have positive 2. Okay, those are my asymptotes, or vertical asymptotes, and I can now start thinking about what, where the function is going to be. Okay, this is a very nice one. So we reason, uh, on, uh, the, on the outside of 2, we have a number like 3. So if we substitute 3 into our function there, substitute 3, we have 1 over 
9 minus that is positive. So the graph is on above, is on above the x-axis on this side. What about here? Let's take uh, 0 or let's take uh, 1. If we put 1 here, then we have 1 over 1 minus 4. So it's going to be a third, so on negative a third. So on this side, the graph is negative. What about here? Let's take a number like negative 1. Put negative 1 here. Negative 1 squared is positive 1, but 1 minus 4 is negative a third. So here is also the graph is going to be negative, right? What about on this side? Put negative 3, for instance. If we pick a point that is negative 3, substitute negative 3 there, we get positive 9. 9 minus 4 is 5 positive, so 1 over 5. 1 over positive 5, so the graph is positive on that side. Okay, this would be referred to as a sign diagram, and I already therefore know how my graph is going to look like. All right, so the graph is going to be a curve there and a curve on this side. And on this side, it usually comes like before I draw it. I know how it's going to look, but let's just substitute. What happens when x is 0? Substitute 0 there, okay, and we get negative a quarter. So the graph crosses at negative a quarter. So we know this graph must go like that. And this point here is at negative 1 over 4. Just as simple as that, all right? That is how the graph of uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, reciprocal function looks like. I hope this stuff is making sense. Of course, the domain, sorry, uh, based on what we've just determined, uh, x cannot be 2 and x cannot be negative 2. So our domain is x is all real numbers, but x cannot be 2 and x cannot be negative 2, like that. There is our domain. How about our range? This is also nice, also important. These are asymptotic about the x-axis, so the lowest value of y can come close to 0, but no 0. So we can say y must be greater than 0, okay, just above 0, but y must also be lower than negative a quarter. So it is important to find the y-intercept there. So we'll say that the range is values of y, which are all real, but y, write it again, y must be greater than 0, less than positive infinity, and you usually say union, so put that in bracket and say union, y must be less than negative 4. So must be uh, negative 4, negative 1 over 4, okay, uh, is actually negative 1 over 4 is larger. So we can say negative infinity, negative infinity, less than uh, y, less than or equal to negative 1 over 4, like that. Uh, bracket there, bracket there, and this is our uh, range. So all values from negative infinity up to negative a quarter, nothing in between, and then just above zero and all the way to infinity, that is acceptable. Yes, okay, uh, next. Uh, this was C, one more, and then there, was, there were those extra questions that I also gave. Right, let's look at uh, the last one from uh, this section. Was it the last? Oh, C was the last. No, there's one more. Here we go. Find the implied domain. So this was the square root uh, and reciprocal as well. So those were only three. Now we start on an additional exercise that we gave. So what we notice here is we don't have, we don't just have uh, a square root function and we don't just have a reciprocal function, but we have the two of them combined, okay? So, uh, find the domain of this 
uh, function here. It is a combination of a reciprocal function and a square root function. How do we find the domain? Well, we combine the reasoning from the previous two ideas. We say, first of all, the number inside the square root sign must be greater than or equal to zero. However, so we would say x, x there, must be greater than or equal to zero. That's, that should be the reasoning for inside the square root sign, for this square root. However, if by saying this, we are saying zero is included. But if we put a zero there, then it now fails the reciprocal function. Okay, because for the reciprocal function, we cannot have a zero. So to ensure we take care of the square root function as well as the reciprocal function, we have to remove the equal sign now. Okay, so x can only be greater than zero to accommodate for the requirements of the two functions we've talked about. So now x must be greater than zero and this by itself is the domain, okay? So this is the domain of the function. Uh, x is in the real set such that x is greater than zero. And even if you left it like this, it is sufficient enough uh, for the domain of the function. Let's see another one that looks a bit uh, rougher than that. That's not so bad. All right, let's see. Uh, all right, oh, here, uh, let me, let, we'll go one by one. So that, uh, so the, here are the four questions and we want to look at them one at a time. So here is the first one then, we've done that. So let's look at the second one, What's this one here. Remember, to take care of both the uh, square root function requirement as well as the reciprocal function requirement, we must now say that that radicand and argument there must be, so we must say in this case, x plus 2 must be greater than 0. It, it's not greater than or equal to, it has to be greater than. It would have been greater than or equal to if the square root was at the top. But now it's in the denominator and the reciprocal function does not allow zero to be part of it, right? And so now we have this. So x must be greater than negative two. And that is our domain. All we have to do is write it in set builder notation. The question is, how does this graph look like? We reason. How might this graph really look like? Uh, this graph is greater than negative two. So greater than negative two, all right? Now we reason, what would happen if x was negative two? Put negative two into the function there. If we put negative two there, it causes this to be a zero. And then now we have one divided by zero. And from our uh, reasoning, we looked at this uh, previously, uh, from the reasoning, we know one over zero is infinite, which is to suggest that the result of this is going to be infinite. Go back and look at that discussion. Infinity means undefined, which means we do not want to discuss it. So to represent it, we need uh, an asymptote, right? So in its place, we uh, so at this point, at this juncture, we draw a vertical line to suggest that our graph cannot cross that vertical asymptote. Uh, the value of x cannot be negative 2 because if we put negative 2 there, it renders the denominator as a 0 and 1 over 0 is infinite, which is not allowed. So we make a boundary here to indicate that our graph must not pass through that point. Okay? Now we go to 0 and uh, see what happens when x is 0. When x is 0, put 0 there, we have 1 over root 2. 1 over root 2, if you've done a bit of uh, mathematics, you will know that uh, 1 over root 2 is the same as root 2 over 2, which I think is 0 0.7071, okay? Uh, some, some may know that is uh, the cosine of 45, also sine of 45, all right? So we know that this is going to be 0 0.7 somewhere there, but what happens as the value of x approaches negative 2? We realize that this number here, this number here gets smaller and smaller, okay? Neg uh, so negative 1.9, leaves us with 0 0.1. So one divided by the square root of zero is a large number, which means as we approach negative two, the function gets bigger and bigger, like that, and positive, all right? And on this side, the function will not go below zero, okay? Because whatever we put here, which must be greater than negative one, the function will not go 
uh, uh, below the zero, you can check that out. And so we expect our graph to look like that. Okay, we'll approach the x-axis as much as possible, but it will never touch it. So this is how the, this function should look like. You should try and sketch it and see what is going on. Okay. Right. Uh, so that is how this graph looks like. And we can talk about the range. The range must be from zero onwards. So the same, same way we've written the range in the other other cases. The domain is all real values of x, except x must be greater than negative 2. Write that in set builder notation, and that should be fine. Right. Uh, that was the second one. The third one, second last one, I believe was quadratic. Yes, no, it's not quadratic. So once again, we reason because of that square root sign. Uh, the argument in there, the 4 minus a half x, cannot be equal to 0, must be greater than 0. So 4 minus 1 over 2x has to be greater than 0. Move the 4 to the other side. We have minus a half x is greater than negative 4. Divide both sides by a half. We get x, we add a negative a half. We are dividing by a negative number. Our sign flips like that, and our answer on this side is 8. So we know our function is such that the values of x must be less than 8. Okay? This is already the domain. Just write it in set builder notation. I, I, I believe we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, we've done enough of those, and everyone should be fine now, hopefully. Um, and so... We go to the point x, uh, x is 8, so pick that point as where our 8 is, okay? Uh, what is happening to our function? It's in the denominator. So at this point, if we were to put 8, if we were to put 8 here, we'll get 4 minus 4, which is 0, which will render this asymptotic. And so at 8, we draw a vertical dotted line to represent an asymptote. That means the graph cannot... Uh, uh, cross that line, and we are told values of x are less than that 8, which means our values of x are on this side, okay? If you sketch this graph, you should realize that as you approach 8 from this side, the graph gets goes higher and higher, okay? Because a number close to 8 makes the difference smaller and smaller, okay? Uh, and where does the graph cross the x-axis? When x is 0, so it's going to be put 0 there, square root of 4 is 2, so 1 over 2. So this graph crosses the x-axis at positive a half, and our line should go like that, with the negative x as the uh, horizontal asymptote, like that. And so it should be possible again for us, based on this, we can determine the range. The range has to be all numbers above uh, zero, so greater than zero. So all real numbers that are greater than zero will constitute the domain, uh, the range of this function. Okay, last question, and that will be the end of this. This video was simply to solve those questions. Once again, if you uh, have an issue with one of the questions, let me know. Uh, if you didn't understand any step, just uh, send me a message, write in the comments down there, and I'll be able to look at it. Yeah. Right, so the last question then. Okay. D, so 1 over the square root of x squared minus 4. Once again, uh, we have a uh, a quadratic, in fact, a difference of two squares uh, under the square root sign. So now we have to say that x squared, I'm going to use a different color. So we'll reason now, again, that x squared minus 4 must be greater than 0. Not greater than or equal to because of the square root and because of the fact that we are now in the denominator. And so this is a, a difference of two squares, so it's a, 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 a conjugate product, meaning I can write x plus 2 
x minus 2 is greater than 0. Is greater than is always positive. So once again, both are positive for, for the product to be greater than 0, for the product to be positive, either both are positive or both are negative. I want to go slowly now, right? Let's assume both are positive. If both are positive, then we are saying x plus 2 is greater than 0, it is positive, and x minus 2 is also greater than 0, so, right? So both are positive. This tells me that x must be greater than negative 2, and this tells me that x must be greater than positive 2, okay? If I draw this, I have negative 2 here, and I have positive 2 here, this is telling me that x is from here this way. And this is telling me that x must take values from here this way. So which, which one? This one is x is greater than 2. And this one is x is greater than negative 2. Which of these two addresses both scenarios? Uh, uh, which one is true for both? If x is greater than 2 it is also greater than negative 2. But if x is greater than negative 2, it is not necessarily greater than positive 2. Why? Because if x was 0, for example, 0 is greater than negative 2, correct, but it is not greater than that. So this uh, uh, option does not satisfy both. So we want an option that satisfies both scenarios. Uh, a number that is greater than 2 is also greater than negative 2, and it is greater than everything on this side. A number that is greater than negative 2 is not necessarily greater than 2. So a number that is greater than this is not necessarily bigger than this, because there is, there is negative 1 here, there is 0, there is 1. All those numbers are, less, are greater than negative 2, but they are not greater than 2. So the number, the option that uh, addresses or that takes care of both scenarios is this one here, okay? Uh, so that's, that's how we reason. So we've reasoned for the case where both of them are positive. Let's reason for the case where both of them are negative because a negative number times a negative number is also positive, right? So if we try that, we'll use this space here, okay? The negative scenario, okay? So we are saying x plus 2 is less than 0. It's negative. And x minus 2 is also less than 0. So this is saying that x must be less than negative 2, and x must be less than positive 2. Which of the two, yeah, which of these two uh, 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 is true for the two? Which one can replace both, okay? So again, the best way is to draw a line so that you can visualize it. Here is negative 2, here is 2. This is saying x is less than negative 2, this one. And this is saying that x is less than 2. So which one, which one represents both? If x, is less than, if x is less than 2, it may not be necessarily less than that. For example, 1 is in there, it is less than 2, but it is not less than negative 2. We want one that is less for both. So we realize that values that are less than negative 2 are definitely also less than 2. But values that are less than 2 are not necessarily less than negative 2. And it is because of that that we go for this option. Okay? I'm trying to make you understand this because I know it didn't come out uh, as cleanly in the previous case. I'm hoping that you are able to see this. Let's see if we can. Now we are saying x is greater than 2 and x is less than negative 2. So if we draw this graph now, I'll put those, those solutions here, our options here. x is greater than 2 is 1. And the other one we've selected is x has to be greater than, has to be less than negative 2, like that. Okay, now I can erase this so that we can sketch that function.
Right, so let's uh, let's sketch this function. So uh, the x-axis. So that's the x-axis. We put a negative two here, and we put two here, right? And uh, x has to be less than negative two. So first of all, when x is negative two and you put it here, you get a zero. Negative two squared is positive four minus that is zero. So we have an asymptote here, definitely an asymptote. And another asymptote is here. So how should our graph look like? If we are not sure, so we know there is a y-axis right there in between, okay? Now we have to reason, where does the graph cross the y-axis? Put a zero in there. If we put a zero there, put a zero there, and what do we notice? Uh, if x is zero, well, we have square root of negative. So the graph does not cross the x-axis ever, okay? Uh, uh, so, is the graph there for a value of x equals 1? Put 1 in here. Whatever you get is going to be square root of a negative number. All right? So the graph cannot be, uh, the, the values of x cannot be in here between. Okay? x must be greater than 2, and x must be less than negative, uh, negative 2. So we cannot have values of x here. That means there is, the graph is nowhere in here between. All right, so now let's go outside of these two boundaries, uh, negative three, if we put negative three there, negative three squared is nine, nine minus four is five, so we get a positive, so the graph is positive there, and on this side also the graph is gonna be positive, so we know this function should look like that. <coughs> okay, so this must be the graph of this function, and you can see that for the range, the range must be values of uh, y that are greater than zero. So any value of y greater than zero is acceptable. Values of x must be less than negative two or greater than positive two. And this is what we, this is what we get, okay? I believe we've done all the questions. I hope you understood what was going on. If you have a question, like I've said, uh, just send me a message or write in the comments and I'll be able to get back to you, all right? Otherwise, thank you for watching the videos. Um, uh, if you like the video, please uh, uh, like it and uh, subscribe, right? That way, if you like it, uh, you will be able to get notification when the next video is, uh, is, uh, is available. All right, thank you very much.